تعریف رو میدن I'm going to start, okay, folks? We, we're letting people in now, Dan. Okay, I'll just give me the, the go ahead. I think you're good. Thank you for joining us today, everyone, for the first of a 12 monthly. 12, 12 session interoperability executive forum that we will be conducting here at MHDC with a number of esteemed guests and colleagues. Um, I'm Denny Brennan, I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Health Data Consortium. And I wanna welcome you to today's Road to Interoperability the Executive Forum. Um, before we introduce you to our co-chair and guest expert, uh, guest experts, let me uh, cover a few housekeeping items first. Um, one, we'll add at the end of today's session an optional 30-minute discussion period. For those of you who would like to stay and have any further questions answered, uh, we've asked uh, both Alex and Mickey to join us for the first hour. You're, you're of course welcome to stay longer, but we don't expect that of you. Uh, we don't presume that of you, but we will have that extra 30 minutes at the end if folks wanna hang and ask further questions or get further clarification. Uh, we're going to ask that you share your thoughts in a number of different ways. Unmute your microphone and speak. Uh, enter your questions or comments in the chat box or raise your hand using the reactions button in the Zoom menu. Our website is being recorded and will be available in approximately 24 hours for members of MHDC. Um, while our kickoff session today is an open and complimentary session for all of the members of our health data community, uh, the remaining sessions will be a members only event. So for those of you who are not members and would like to join MHDC, we encourage you to reach out and contact us at mahealthdata, I'm sorry, at membership at mahealthdata.org. And um, if you are, interested in just the series, we'd love to have you as a member, but if you're interested in just the series, then you can uh, attend the series for uh, $399 for the year. So we think that's a great value. We'd love to have as big a, a, a group in attendance. This is a forum and by definition is intended to be a place where we exchange ideas, we exchange comments, we we learn together as we go through this process. Um, after today, members and those of you who uh, pay the non-member rate will be able to um, attend all our future sessions and we'll notify you when the, well in advance of those sessions when they come, come online. Um, you can play along with us on social media. If you are so inclined, you can see the MHDC hashtag, as well as the, I'm sorry, the MHDC handle, as well as the event hashtag. Um, and lastly, we'll be following up today's discussion with a survey that we'll be sending to you in your email. Now, let me introduce our co-chair for the 2023 Executive Forum Series of MHDC Board Chair David Caruso, the Chief Technology Officer at Point32 Health. Bill Young, unfortunately, is unable to join us today, but as David and Bill and I have discussed, we're, we're more than pleased to have David speak for both of you. David, take it away. Thanks, Denny. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the 2023 Forum Series. I'm David Caruso, as Denny had mentioned, uh, co-chair of the series. And I'm delighted to continue the longstanding forum with a new focus on broadening our community 
engaging industry and government leaders, and providing a dynamic educational experience for our members. We look forward to seeing you throughout 2023 and hope those of you who are not MHDC members will join our consortium. Thank you, Denny. Thank you, Dave. Uh, moving forward, excuse me for a moment. I have a script I want to stay absolutely on top of here. Um, and Denny, the new if executive I just interrupt you really briefly. I did see an email from Mickey saying that he was having trouble accessing the link. So I sent him um, the, the updated link that I had, but um, he may need some assistance getting on. Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. We need your technical support. We know we've gone to the right person. We appreciate that. I don't know about all that, uh, but <laughs> just all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the new executive form, and then we'll get started ASAP. The new executive form offers a high level view of interoperability from its regulatory, technical, and industry roots and to its essential components and features. We're going to be covering interoperability as a concept, as, as a method of engaging consumers, of achieving greater health equity. And we're also going to be looking at many facets associated with what constitutes interoperability. And this is going to be an exciting series of sessions. Uh, we have brought experts from government, from industry, and from the technology community to assist us in helping all of us understand what interoperability is. I believe all of us have some idea of what it is, but I think what we think today and what we think at the end of this year will be two very different things. So we're looking forward to that. Today, we're focusing on what is interoperability. Apart from being an eight syllable buzzword that we, we hear more and more of these days, it, what does it actually mean and why is everyone talking about it? How, how is it the mechanism that makes everything else in healthcare work? And how does it enable improvements in patient care? Uh, I see we have folks who are ready to get in. All right. Our guest experts today, and I'm very, very pleased and deeply gratified to welcome both Alex Muggy, the Director and Deputy Chief Health Informatics Officer at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Welcome, Alex. Thank you for joining us today. And Mickey Tripathi, the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Was Mickey able to get on, Katie or Lynn? I see Mickey right there. Hi, hey, Mickey, welcome. There he is. I'm in. He's in. It's like trying to get into a submarine sometimes here, it feels like, or an a crowded elevator. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have four questions that we want to use today to frame our discussion, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the four questions that we are looking at today, broadly speaking, to guide the discussion are, what is interoperability? As seen by Alex, you and Mickey, we all have our definitions, as I said initially, but what is it as you see it? Why is it so important? And what are the key components to making interoperability work? And finally, what is the role that the federal government is playing in making interoperability happen? So we want to now get started. We are looking at uh, being uh, well on time. And uh, with that, um, why don't I start, Alex, with you and get some of your perspectives as you see it related to these four questions. Um, sure, so I uh, I think, you know, when it comes to what what is interoperability, I, I, I think when I was trying to think of a response to this question, I was thinking more of what, is, what are the challenges and why do we need interoperability? Um, and so, you know, really thinking about what the way we used to talk about this uh, when we were first standing up my office at, at uh, CMS, we would talk about, you know, healthcare as sort of this like Tower of Babel where, you know, everybody's got the same good intentions, um, but we're not able to communicate across um, across the different systems to achieve our, our end goal, which is ultimately um, having the right data at the right place at the right time to make the best possible healthcare decisions. Um, 
And interoperability is that thing, that piece that we're missing um, that helps to bridge that communication challenge. And, and so I'm not sure that there's necessarily one particular um, standard or approach. I mean, as, as many of you know, um, at CMS and jointly with ONC, we've, we talk about FIRE as being the standard for interoperability. And, and that is what we, uh, the standard that we use um, most frequently when we're proposing new policies about data exchange, but it's not necessarily one standard. It's also a way of communicating that we just don't necessarily have nailed down in healthcare. Um, this is, you know, we also talk about um, interoperability as a journey, not an endpoint. So there's not one point in time where we're going to achieve full interoperability. It's going to be ever evolving because technology is always evolving. As we know, the standards are always um, evolving and, and we're always Always innovating on those standards to, to make them um, better, to exchange more data, more accurate data, um, and uh, more streamlined data. And so we as a culture, as a healthcare community, have to continue to evolve um, along with that technology in order to get us to, you know, uh, uh, further on that path to interoperability. Often when I present, I have um, a slide that shows a roadmap to interoperability that shows just sort of this future state um, that's uh, that's a better better communication in healthcare, um, but it's it's always an arrow. You know, there's not like that end point where we say, okay, we've achieved it and we're done. This is something we'll always be be working on, and that's why Mickey and I have. Uh, have great uh, job security is because we're always going to be working on this. We're going to have to update policies, technology, and there's going to be culture change um, to uh, to accommodate this um, and keep us moving forward on that journey. So I don't know, just some initial just initial thoughts, and I, I bet Mickey has uh, has even more insights to share. Mickey, what about from your perspective? Um, sure. So um, Alex and I made a pinky promise not last night that we weren't going to do presentations. So I'm glad that uh, well, we're, we welcome that. If I had to handle excellent. any other any other technology, I would I'd be under the table. So thank you for that. Yeah, great. Um, well, you know, definitely just to build on on what Alex had um, had described, which I think was you know was, was great. I mean, ONC has on our website. We actually, if you go to different places on our website, we have slightly different definitions, um, which, uh, uh, you know, which is sort of interesting. Uh, maybe it points to the um, sort of the, uh, you know, sort of the grayness of, of the term. But, um, but I think if you, you know, kind of go to um, one of the definitions, and I think the IEEE definition is something along the lines of, you know, interoperability is the ability of two or more systems to exchange health information and use the information once it's received. Um, so the idea of having systems be able to um, get information from each other and be able to take that information and process it and turn it into actions that end users um, on the receiving side um, are able to then um, conduct using using that information. I guess the um, a couple of things that I would uh, you know sort of highlight um, and perhaps expand on a little bit more from Alex's uh, comments are one. Um, I don't think of interoperability as a single thing, and I think that that's probably something for us to dissect and parse a little bit, uh, you know, on this call and as an industry. I think there is a temptation to think of interoperability as being a single thing that, you know, binary. We will have, we don't have interoperability, we will have interoperability, or there is one type of interoperability. It's TEPCA. TEPCA is interoperability. I mean, I don't think, I think we just need to recognize that there is a complete, a whole gradation of interoperability. Some of it's very fine grained, some of it's very coarse grained, and it really is, um, uh, you know, tailored to the type of um, business that you want to conduct. Sometimes it's totally fine to have very coarse grained exchange of information because that's the level of trust you have, that's the kind of um, uh, capabilities that you want to be able to, um, uh, and the kind of workflows um, that you want to be able to enable, whereas in other kinds of um, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, exchange patterns or uses, you have a high need for very high quality, high frequency, high reliability information because your systems are depending on each other in perhaps very fundamental ways. So I think that we just have to remember that there is a whole spectrum of things that we might think of as interoperability all under that umbrella. Um, the second thing I would note, and, you know, maybe this is a conversation for us to continue here as well, is I'd like us to think about moving beyond kind of that idea of interoperability, perhaps to a more dynamic kind of um, 
kind of term, which is interactivity. So, you know, we certainly want information to get pushed from one system to another, whether it's a query or a poll, whatever, whatever that is. But, you know, but I send information to another system and then it does whatever it does and processes it. Or, but I think if you look at the way that, you know, sort of the Internet economy works, you have, you know, increasing interactivity of systems, which is systems that are dependent on each other um, in a dynamic way. And they're built with. And, uh, you know, with an approach that assumes that they will have access to other systems to be able to get real time information to be able to process that and deliver information to the end users. You know, think about the way Kayak and, and um, uh, you know, Expedia work. They've got APIs that fire off in the background. They've got interoperability. But more important, they have what I would call interactivity, which is an expectation that they'll be able to ping JetBlue, get back the information in real time and present it to you um, and be able to do that in an ongoing and a dynamic way tailored to your specific needs and requests. So I think as an industry, you know, healthcare is probably the biggest industry, I would argue, that doesn't have that kind of interactivity in place, where there's arguably the greatest need for it. You think about the different use cases where that kind of interactivity would be, um, you know, just in, incredibly um, important. Prior off is a great example, right? We want to be able to have that kind of interactivity to be able to do as much real-time processing of information and feedback back to the user. So I think that we need to, you know, sort of think about um, how, uh, uh, System, we want systems to be able to interact with each other, exchanging information, but increasingly we want them to be um, built so that they can rely on each other for the kinds of functions they want to be able to perform. If I could just um, tag on to Please, what Alex. In his opening yeah. remark, um, you know, there are these different definitions of interoperability, and, and ONC certainly has some on their websites, but I also want to highlight that. Um, in different laws that regulate that, uh, that, that set the statutory requirements for CMS and ONC, there are also different <laughs> definitions of interoperability. So um, there's a, a definition that was under MACRA and there's a definition that was under the Cures Act. So legally, there are different definitions of interoperability. So if you wanted to hit us with a really tough question, Denny, I think you've got it right here with what is interoperability because it's totally defined totally differently. Um, it, it all tends to get towards that same concept, and I think Mickey described it super well, but um, I just want to highlight that, you know, even legally, we have different definitions, which can make our jobs and can make the policy side of, of getting to whatever interoperability is even more challenging. Right. It's like, it's like well, pornography. We know it when we see it, right? <laughs> I was just about to say the same thing, which said, I don't know what that says. <laughs> I've never about, seen about it, Mickey. This session. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, me either. That's just what people tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, um, we want to make sure uh, folks in the audience know that you are free to ask questions at any time. And this is a forum. This is not a webinar. So we encourage you to to raise your hand or unmute your mic um, or just ping us if you uh, have a question you want us to ask on your behalf. Um, let's, let's, dip, let's do a little bit here around um, interactivity because this kind of, in some ways, is the answer to the second question. And I think the idea of being able to connect is a necessary but insufficient, as you point out, Mickey, a necessary but insufficient step to actually working more collectively or working more collaboratively or making the experience of the patient uh, a better experience. Uh, Alex, would you talk a little bit about what you and, and the folks at CMS see as the critical imperatives behind interoperability? What is it that we need to accomplish tomorrow? that we can't accomplish today without this, without this interactivity? Um, yeah, that's another another great question. I think, um, you know, we, we have a pretty terrific healthcare system. So I don't want this to, um, you know, I don't. I don't want to to imply that that we don't. We have a healthcare system that's constantly learning and growing, um, and evolving and creating and innovating new technology. Um, but I don't think that we have been able to unlock the true benefits of our healthcare system uh, because we don't always have the right data at the right time. And that is what CMS is trying to achieve um, with. 
uh, with this work towards working towards and dropping this journey to interoperability is making sure that patients and providers and payers and, and all of the players that are involved in patient care have access to the right data at the right time so they can make the most informed health decisions. And you know, we can certainly make decisions in healthcare with partial data, but think of how much better informed those decisions can be if you understand a patient's complete history or all of the factors that are weighing into a particular medical condition, um, I think we have the opportunity to make better decisions in healthcare when we have access to that data. And that's that's part of what interoperability helps us to achieve, right? Is, is getting that data to the right place um, and getting that um, complete patient record. And also ensuring that patients, you know, we're removing some of the burden on patients that they don't have to be the shepherds of their data. You know, um, so often we hear about the patients that are lugging around these paper files um, from their previous doctors trying to just put together their medical history um, so that they can have uh, that record. And it would be so much more efficient if the provider could have access to that data you know, in a format that they can use to it within, you know, let's say their EHR in, in the form of meaningful information. So not just data and not pieces of paper that they have to sort through, but meaningful information that they have access to so that they can make some of the, that clinical decision-making easier on the provider um, and, and get to that better healthcare. So I think, you know, if, if I had to say as one thing, I would say that that's what we're trying to achieve is to make sure that we can improve healthcare by having that data available. Now, there's also the other element that we have more recently um, put a focus on, which is also reducing burden in healthcare. We we hear um, about the significant provider uh, burnout that is um, that is happening in our healthcare industry. And just to think that there are things that interoperability can bring that reduce that burden, make the healthcare system more efficient, um, and can take some of that weight off of providers. So with our most recent um, uh, rule that was released in uh, December, the interoperability and prior authorization rule, that's really the part that we looked at is how can interoperability and um, standardizing the electronic exchange of prior authorization data, how can that reduce burden in healthcare and take that element off of the provider so they can put that time back into patient care? So I guess that also comes back to in the end, it's all about patient care and making sure that we're getting the best care for the patient, be it through um, more data availability or you know reduce burden on providers so they can spend more time with those patients. We I I believe and I know that that this is you know why why we think this is so important at CMS is that um that it's all about getting back to the patient and bringing our healthcare system back to that central focus and ensuring uh better care again you know through more data and reduced burden. Um, so, so that's, and that's, and as you'll see in our policies, that's really what it comes down to. And where it, with each of our policies and new rules, um, it, it all comes back to that. Well, we have uh, Bagley and Kim uh, in our audience have said, uh, one, that their definitions are that wherever I've treated my health information from all my providers and health facilities is available electronically wherever I go. Uh, I think Bagley, that's an excellent, a definition and Kim says interoperability to me as a public health professional, a patient and a mom is to a, to a special needs son is a smooth health data connection and communication without the need to understand what's going on in the background and essentially knowing what time it is without having to know how the watch is built uh, that provides her and her family and the other any other end user the data they need right away. Uh, it can tell the whole health story in one click. That would be her true interoperability experience. Uh, thank you both, Magley and Kim, for your comments. Mickey, um, you have talked as one of the core features or goals of interoperability at, at ONC, you refer to equity by design. Could you talk a little bit about how interoperability is so essential to this critical, this critical mission of achieving a more equitable health system. Sure, I mean, I think we've talked, you know, for a number of years about, you know, the, the right data or information at the right place at the right time. Um, and which I think, you know, kind of reflects and builds on or is another way of stating, you know, kind of what, what Kim was talking about. Um, and, um, and if you think about that, um, related to what I was, you know, talking about before, the different types of interoperability that are appropriate for the different uses. The, you know, the need that an emergency room physician has, for example, in that particular moment, 
where they're thinking about um, you know a particular treatment or a particular prescription is very different than the need that a Kim might have as a patient for just wanting to be able to have all of her information should she choose to do that in kind of a you know sort of a nice longitudinal narrative kind of um, you know sort of depiction. Those are really different needs, and I think that that's you know a part of what we want to be able to do is to say. Um, that we want to be able to have an ecosystem that meets both of those needs appropriately. I mean, right now we have, you know, very clunky ways of doing that, right? If you think about the interoperability networks that are available today, um, you know, which are great. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of pro uh, it's a tremendous amount of progress. It doesn't satisfy either of those needs. Um, it delivers a, you know, a, a, a three-year CCD to the emergency room physician who is just looking for medication allergies. Um, and so they, they often will just say, I, I'm actually not going to look at that. I'm going to pick up the phone. Um, you know, too much work. I'll just do it the old fashioned way. Um, or I'll make my best guess. And it doesn't meet the individual's need as well, because it just feels like that's only part of a story. And it's really hard for me to, you know, sort of aggregate it with my other information and bring it all together, you know, all of that. So I think that's a part of the next level need is to be able to, you know, think about how, what portfolio of interoperability capabilities we want to be able to have to be able to allow people to you know do both of those things um and as uh, as 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 they want to um as it relates to you know health equity i think that that's you know just another dimension of it that to the extent that we're talking about the right data at the right place at the right time um to uh to certain individuals um a more expansive view of the information that affects their health may be incredibly important uh, it may be just as important as you know their medical history, what we think of as their medical history, and so you know thinking about how we bring that to bear and um, allow the um, uh, you know sort of the the access to information um, differentially so that it's available to those who um, are in different circumstances as it relates to uh, you know access to information, language, things like that. Um, I think is all a part of this core concept of you know sort of saying we do we need to have a much more, you know, sort of tailored and nuanced view of what interoperability is and how it varies according to need. Um, Mickey, you, you know, when we think of interoperability or interactivity, uh, we we understand that there are a number of steps that organizations have to take, and there are some central components that are a part of what makes interoperability work. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, from your vantage point at ONC, what you see as some of the critical components of interactivity? What are some of the, the milestones or elements that organizations need to, to incorporate as they increase their ability to interact? Yeah, I mean, I well, I think that, you know, fully embracing open industry standards and approaches to open industry standards, I think, would be the first thing. Um, I think everyone can, you know, sort of make that effort, um, you know, to do that with an eye toward, uh, you know, um, uh, being able to have, um, you know, be model citizens as a way, as a, in a way. I mean, we can all get caught, caught in this downward spiral of, you know, well, I'm not going to do it because they're not going to do it and they're not going to do it because I'm not going to do it. Um, and then, you know, and then here we are, and we'll talk a little bit, you know, later about what's the role of the federal government um, as we see these downward spirals and having to step in and say, all right, well, there's only one way to break that spiral, um, which is to say the federal government has to come in and, you know, kind of cut through some of that stuff. So, um, you know, so I think the first thing is, um, is pushing really hard toward approaches for sharing information um, uh, using open industry standards and building processes that actually, you um, uh, are forward leaning with respect to sharing information. And I've had too many conversations where, you know, hospitals, for example, um, you know, will ask, so if I don't send ADTs to that other provider, would that be information sharing or would that be information blocking? And my first response is, so wait a minute, you're not going to share the information if I say, you know, if I say, no, that's not information blocking, that means you're not going to do it. Why, you know, why would you do that? <laughs> why in the, why on earth are you even asking me this question? I mean, you should be sharing ADTs with all the other providers. You know, why would you not do that? Um, so, you know, and 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 um, you know, I've had I 
personally had this experience um, just uh, three, four months ago in Massachusetts, um, where I think all of you know, or most of you know, I, I live and my family lives and my mother uh, had hip surgery and she broke her hip. Um, she was in a very good hospital um, that is on a very good EHR system. And we were transferring her to a rehab hospital, which is about three quarters of a mile down the road. Um, another very good hospital um, who's on another very good um, uh, EHR system. Um, and uh, as I stood there watching right in front of me, they printed off her record and handed it to us and then said, bring it to the other hospital and they will scan it and upload it into that EHR. Right. And it's like right in front of me, you're doing this. <laughs> and then, of course, I was like, so have you guys heard of Commonwealth, Care Equality? Both of your vendors are absolutely connected. There is no doubt in my mind. I know they are. And the frontline people are like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but that would be fantastic. You mean, you know, we might be able to not print this off and not scan it into the other system? God, I, you know, I wish for that world. And I would say that that's something that those hospitals could do is why aren't they pushing all the way down to their frontline staff to say, this is the way you do it. And, you know, and even going so far as to say, we're going to start shutting off those other mechanisms, actually, and preventing you from doing those kinds of things. Um, so I think that that's, you know, that's a part of the forward leaning of, you know, of, of absolutely doing that. Um, and doing as much participation in po as possible in these interoperability frameworks and interoperability networks. Alex, one of the 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 aspects that we've we've noticed since the interoperability uh, rules were introduced during the prior administration was, and VJ asks this question: How will interoperability help break the trust or the the mistrust between payers and providers? when it comes to collaborating in, in the interest of patients. What are some of your thoughts about bringing payers and providers who are now at loggerheads for reasons that are abundant, COVID not being the least of them, but you know, there's an element of, of essential, there's a mind shift here. Can you talk a little bit about what CMS, what you and the folks at CMS are thinking about how this can help bind or or organize or mobilize both payers and providers to support the patient better than they currently are? Sure. So I think one of the things that you just pointed out, um, Denny, is important to note, it, note that um, I think that there are trust issues uh, between payers and providers that span a multitude of reasons. And so we're not going to address every single one. Um, and, uh, and some of that's probably just, you know, the, the working relationship that exists. Um, but I think Mickey and I have both talked about having the right data at the right place at the right time, um, and that being a critical part of patient care. And through uh, I mean, I can speak to the rules that that, that CMS has, has published, you know, sp specifically um, through our proposals, we are proposing to require that payers would share data directly with providers. So if they have a patient's health record, make that data available to the provider. I think that's one way that would build some trust with the provider side of the house, um, because we know that providers give data to payers all the time. You know, for, to, in order to process a claim, not only do you have to say, I saw this patient on this day, but sometimes you have to provide lab results or diagnosis and additional information. So the providers are giving all that information and they're not always receiving something back. Um, and I think that through our provider access API proposals, um, which would require payers to share data with the providers um, directly, I think that can change some of that dynamic and say, okay, I have this data that you need, you have a data that I need, and we can work together um, and that will help us get to the best interest of the patient. Um, I think also with, um, it, you know, we've heard that prior authorization is a significant, has historically been a significant burden for providers. And I think it's also a burden for payers. I mean, it, it's certainly a necessary part of the healthcare system, but it, it requires a lot of work and it's, and it's no, no small feat to, um, to, to manage the number of prior authorizations that are out there. But I think that in streamlining that process and taking some of the burden out of the administrative piece of that, um, 
will also help to build some trust because it will, it, it's, it's less of a, you know, I'm making you jump through hoops and more of a, let's make sure that this is the right care for this patient, that this is medically necessary treatment. And that's what it's intended to be. But because of the way that, um, that that data exchange currently works through portals and faxes and, and all sorts of things. I think that that breaks down some of the trust because it feels more like jumping through hoops than the intended goal of making sure that, that we're providing um, appropriate patient care. So in some ways, I think just uh, sharing that data and having some of that bi-directional data exchange and sort of instead of a one-way flow, I think that will um, help to build that trust and break down some of those challenges. And I'm certain that there are other challenges that exist, like I said, but you know, it, it is a, a first step in um, and getting the healthcare system geared more back more towards the patient. And then if I, I want to say something about what, what Mickey said, because I love what, what he said. And I am wondering how, and maybe this is a question back to the audience of like how can CMS and ONC work together to make this work? So Mickey said, you know, maybe we need to start taking away some of those old, uh, the old ways of doing things. If we can get the EHRs connected, or these systems connected and get the data flowing um, through, you know, electronic and interoperable means, can we get rid of that, that print, you know, the, that print function? And so often when we talk about that at CMS, we hear that folks, folks saying, um, you know, well, that's a fallback for, you know, certain hospitals aren't going to be able to, to, um, to share the data electronically. So we always have to have these other mechanisms available. And I feel like if we keep that argument going, we'll never get rid of the fax machine in healthcare. Um, and, you know, we'll never get rid of the printer in healthcare. And, and I just wonder, you know, what, what are some ways that CMS and ONC can work to, uh, to change that mindset or do that culture shift to get more towards that electronic data exchange and just remove those other ways of doing things without uh, causing, you know, unintentional, uh, challenges it, it, as well, and um, uh, for you know, particularly for we hear for rural providers or uh, in, in hospitals or you know uh, areas where broadband is a challenge. You know, how much is that really a challenge, and how much um, how much more should we be leaning in towards removing those outdated ways of doing things? Excellent. We have a number of comments from folks online. Um, I'm going to go to David's comment or question first. We have a lot of ways of, of connecting and, and interacting. We have APIs, uh, FIRE specifically. We have TEFCA, you know, and as a colleague of ours says, all good solutions are hybrid solutions. And Mickey, you talked about fine grade and coarse grade, you know, levels of interoperability. Could you, Alex, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the importance of FIRE and the importance of uh, some of the underlying data standards like US CDI. Could you just give us your your perspective on those? And then Mickey, I'm going to come back to you and, and get yours as well. So CMS and ONC jointly back in 2020, we released a uh, rule, each agency, agency released a rule um, in which we highlighted the use of FIRE for data exchange. So the CMS Interoperability and Patient Access final rule, we finalized it um, the use of FHIR for the APIs for, uh, for patient data exchange, so that our patient access API, as well as our provider directory API. And ONC um, likewise uh, finalized the use of FHIR for, um, for, for patient access, as well as um, putting it into their, their code of federal regulations. Um, so really, really driving home that FHIR is the, the chosen standard for interoperability. And I think that's for a, a number of reasons. I think the flexibility that FHIR brings and the ability to, um, to customize the data that, that would be exchanged and the, the use of the various resources, I think it's just a much more user-friendly standard um, and, uh, and, can, and can accommodate many different uses, including sharing data directly with patients, which we don't always see with some of the other standards that we use for data exchange. So, um, so I think that, you know, that certainly has um, driven a lot of development in the fire space over the, the last few years. We're continuing to see more use cases pop up. But then, you know, I do want to also highlight that there are other standards that we use in healthcare um, where we don't use fire or we do have to go with a hybrid approach. Our prior authorization proposals is one example. It's a HIPAA administrative transaction. Um, prior authorization is, so we have to include the X12278 because that is uh, the required standard for prior authorization. So in our proposals, we have 
the X12 standard, and then we talk about kind of bookending that, if you will, with a fire transaction to make it to give it that user friendly ability of the fire standard um, while still maintaining um, compliance with the, the HIPAA regulations. And then, um, as some of you may have seen last month, we also, uh, CMS also released a rule for um, healthcare attachments um, in which they also propose um, an X12 standard, the, the 275 for um, attachments. So it may be that there's some hybrid approach in these standards going forward, or it may be that um, it's, it is time to look at some of our other standards and, and transition to fire. Um, but it's really, you know, what is working for the industry now and what's in place? Some of what, this is what is the path of least resistance? Um, we hear, sorry if I'm uh, changing subjects again, but, you know, going on to moving to sort of price transparency. Uh, we recently did an RFI um, about the advanced um, EOA, the advanced um, explanation of benefits or AEOB um, is a requirement out of the No Surprises Act. And in that we talk about price transparency and uh, pricing, and we ask questions about the use of fire for, um, for producing that AEOB. And we heard somewhat overwhelmingly, at least from the payer community, that they preferred to stay with X12. Um, is that because that's what they have in place? Um, is there a hybrid solution that we should be looking at? I think that it opened up a lot more questions for CMS because we were under the impression that the that fire would uh, would be the best suited to support this. And we heard through the comment responses that maybe there are other things that we need to take a look at. Um, so certainly there are hybrid solutions. I think there is this is part of that continued evolution and change that we have to keep adapting to as technology changes, so must our policies. We have to make sure that we're keeping date with uh, keeping up to date with the new technologies that come about. So um, I'm always pro fire, yay fire, um, but also want to make sure that we're doing what's best for industry and what's most realistic for industry. We don't want to require everyone to build something that in the end isn't going to achieve our, our goals. So if that means looking at other options or hybrid solutions, then that's what we'll do. Great. Well, we're going to talk more about fire and subsequent uh, presentations and discussions in this executive forum. Mickey, before I turn to you, I want to uh, turn to some members of our audience. Tim Capstick, you have a, a comment in the in the um, in the the comments or the chat session. Can you share with us what your perspective is online? And rather than me reading it back, you'll need to unmute your microphone. But perhaps you can share with us what your what your perspective here is. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to do that. And thanks for uh, <clears throat> calling uh, on me. Yeah, I think that uh, what I've found in, in the time I've been focused in this space, particularly on the <clears throat> health plan payer side, and of course, here at SureScripts, we sort of see both sides of the fence. We see the provider side, the pharmacy side, and the payer side, as well as the uh, pharmacy benefit management uh, payer side. And so what I'm finding is that uh, there's no shortage of <laughs> interest and desire from the payers to uh, not only share information with providers, but but to also uh, be able to to more freely exchange information for for my gosh, you know, dozens and dozens of use cases, uh, <clears throat> anywhere you know from treatment sort of to non-treatment, uh, payment and operations type stuff, and there there just is again no shortage of roadblocks uh, to achieving that. So, um, and from where I sit. There, there seems to be some pretty simple ways to do this. We just have to be able to free up the data more and, and you know, get, get uh, I guess, more trust within the system to be able to do that. And then when you talk to the provider community, um, they seem to be a little apprehensive to just allow more free exchange of information because of the, the concern that information may be used against them uh, in, in any number of fashions, right? If they have a progress note or something in the chart that uh, somebody reads and uh, it doesn't sort of match up with whatever was done or there's a question about why that was done or if something's missing, right? Now, now they're held accountable. And so there's, <clears throat> there's just a, from my perspective, a lot of challenges around um, really rapidly achieving this. Um, but I, I'm confident we will. And, and I think with, you know, the, the bright minds we have focused on this, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, it just, anyway, that, that was sort of my perspective and I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Mickey, uh, you stand on the provider side of the house, if, 
in a manner of speaking at, at ONC. Could you talk a little bit about these trust issues and the way in which interactivity will either lessen them or exacerbate them? Um, yeah, so um, one of the big barriers that, um, you know, that we've had, if you just look at um, the, uh, you know, sort of the growth of network interoperability is if you look at the nationwide networks, for example, Care Quality, Commonwealth, eHealth Exchange, they all, um, in principle, allow payers to participate, but in practice, payers can't really participate. To the extent that payers participate, it's a payer who is also a provider. And as a provider, they're able to participate, but as payers, they're not able to participate um, because of these trust issues um, is a part of it. And because um, a number of the vendors have filled in that gap by having side businesses with their payer portals, for example. And there's a certain degree of resistance to wanting to commoditize something that each of the vendors is able to you know, make money on the side on. Um, but at the heart of it, I think, are some of these um, some of these trust issues. And so, one of the you know really interesting conversations that we're having with Tefka is um, that you know we strongly believe that payers, um, public health, um, as another you know key stakeholder um, uh, you know key key state, state stakeholder group, um, need to be at the adult table of nationwide interoperability. And as a part of that discussion with the payers. What we're talking about is what's you know sort of the reciprocity here, and I you know to Vijay's uh, question about you know sort of that trust. Um, one of the things that um, you know that has been a big barrier is that, um, and I think you know you mentioned it, and I'll you know mention it again, is that each party feels that the information could be used for other strategic purposes and used against them. I guess that you know when you look think about it from a provider perspective, right now the way all of this is constructed, the the providers feel, um, I think, with a lot of justification, that this whole conversation about interoperability between payers and pi providers is a one-way street. It's provide it's payers expecting providers to provide them with a bunch of information, and to the extent that payers have been saying, you know, we'll provide information back, it's well, we'll provide back the, the clinical data we have, we'll provide back the labs, you know, whatever it is. And a provider, I think, understandably feels like, great, I send you five terabytes of data and you send me five labs. Um, you know, that's, that's not really not what we're thinking about in terms of reciprocity. Um, so one of the things that we've, you know, sort of been um, working on with the um, with the payment and healthcare operations use case, and we're going to be publishing our standard operating procedure, our draft standing oper operating procedure here within the next couple of weeks um, for TEFCA, is we've been having essentially, you know, kind of a negotiation with the payers and the providers to say that the reciprocity here builds on what you know what CMS has actually put into its um, into its uh, NPRM into the draft interoperability rule, which is to say the reciprocity ought to be payer providers provide the clinical data that payers are you know are, are obligated to get. I mean the payers are authorized to get all of that information, but that payers should in return make available all the claims data in the same way that DPC pilot does and in what's in the interoperability rule, what's called the provider API. And that as it relates to TEFCA exchange, that would be the response. That if a provider queries a payer, the expectation would be that they would get clinical data, sure, whatever they've got, um, but that's a pretty measly amount for, you know, in, in a lot of cases, but more important, what they should be able to get is all of the claims on their patients, fee-for-service, risk, all of them. Strip out the payment information. You don't need the payment information in there again, as um, you know, as the CMS rule says. But provide back that claims data. And interestingly, we, you know, what we've heard, um, you know, often is payer. I've heard payers say to me, "Well, wait a minute, but you know, what are they going to do with that data? They're going to use it, you know, to in their negotiations. They're going to use it to consolidate. They're going to use it, you know." And my response is, "You see the problem then, <laughs> because that's exactly." <laughs> What providers say is what are the ways in which you're going to use that data? And if we all at the end of the day agree that each party is actually authorized to have that data, and they're all once it's once it's in their possession as HIPAA regulated entities, they're authorized to use it for anything that HIPAA says they're authorized to use it for. And so trying to put up these, you know, artificial constraints on, you know, on the uses of that data or to not allow the sharing of that data. I think it's just a core principle that we have to get, you know, we have to get through. And so at least, you know, with TEPCA, we're pushing really hard on saying that that's the quid pro quo for payer participation. 
um, and, and you know, an expectation that payers can you know can participate fully in this is that they've got to give um, as well as receive. And we're hoping that the value to them will be um, that they don't have to um, uh, you know sort of make a deal with Epic, make a deal with Cerner, make a deal with Athena Health, where they're paying $1.50 a CCD, which is you know what a lot of the payers are doing right now, and that you're able to commoditize that whole bottom of the stack so that they can just get the information. Um, and, um, and to the extent that they are going to have to do what's in the CMS interoperability rule, you know, we'll see what the final rule says, that doing that um, in a way that's scalable using Tefka infrastructure is, you know, is the best, you know, sort of business decision they could probably make as they start to think about, you know, how they're going to meet that requirement. Well, in a way, having everybody use everyone else's information against them is a more informed marketplace. Right. You know, it's basic, it's <laughs> essentially, you know, a, a more transparent and a better market for, uh, for achieving, you know, greater value. If they're both parties are more informed and they both go into their respective negotiations with, you know, the intention to, use that information to achieve their business goals, knowing that everyone is doing exactly the same thing is a much better place than where we are now. So right. I, I agree with that point. Alex, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the, um, the role of the federal government? You know, you, you know, we have a lot of work to do. You, you, the federal government has played a critical role in kind of, setting the ground rules, laying the foundation. Um, what do you see as sort of critical for uh, the marketplace, the, the health plan, the health consumer, the health provider community? What do they need to, to do next to, to help you continue to improve and, and you know, better regulate an industry that is just starting to understand what a big change this is? Well, it's interesting you say that because I, I think that um, <clears throat> on our end, we are often right, like, uh, how much should we be regulating this space? You know, as I mentioned, we've um, we've sort of all agreed that, that fire is a state of French and we put that into regulation. And now, um, you know, we have tried to take a step back to say, what does how much does industry want to lead this from here on out? You know, if we've if we've set um, this set the signals and given the indications, um, and you know, Mickey's team has, is making Tefka more a reality um, every day. Um, uh, we've identified the standards. We've put out certain baseline requirements for data exchange with the APIs. We've gotten payers involved, so there's requirements for interoperability on payers. There's requirements on providers. You know, at what point? Um, does the industry then and the standards development world take over and continue to drive this forward? You know, there, I think there's always a balance of how much do we want to regulate um, versus how much do we want to watch the innovation um, happening on um, in, the, in the private world and in the standard space and in the technology space. So, um, you know, from, from my perspective, of course, I, I, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't give a shameless plug to comment on the proposed rule. Um, we hope that, you know, the comment period is open until March uh, 15, 13, 15th. Um, it's open until March. Um, and it would be great if everyone could comment on the proposed rule and tell us what they think about, you know, we've got several APIs in there that are all fire based. And then we've got the prior authorization API that is a hybrid, um, which is fire and X12 together. And, you know, it would be really great to hear from industry. Did we get Get that right um, or is there something that we need to continue to evaluate in that space there's also the um, attachments reg that is out um, which uses uh, the x12 standards for healthcare attachments you know it didn't get that right is there is there a different direction that we should be taking there um, we need to hear all of that feedback first i think and then um, we need to hear more from industry where do we need to continue to regulate? Obviously, we need to continue to keep our policies up to date to keep pace with technology innovations. So new versions of the implementation guides are coming out, um, new and, uh, and updated technology with the US CDI, new versions are coming available, um, new versions of FHIR. So we need to keep pace with all of that. But do we continue at this pace of requiring certain APIs or um, do we need to step back and look at um, more up, uh, regulating and updating the standards and adding to existing APIs. I think that's that's part of what we need to hear from you. Um, so I'm going to turn that question back to the audience and, and to folks commenting on the rules. Um, and 
and and then for you know to support us like i said comment on the rule and then um and then you know help us to identify other areas where we should be involved or perhaps where we take more of a convening role versus a regulatory role um all of this is a balance and um and we want to make sure that we're getting it right mickey any final comments from you in the few minutes we have remaining um wow that time went fast <laughs> it sure did you could stay longer if you like but we want to be mindful of your time um yeah no i mean i, I think that um that uh you know what we are uh you know pushing really hard for is um to have the ability to have uh you know sort of multiple layers of interoperability um that serve different purposes so we talked about uh, fire APIs. Um, we talked about Tefka um, a, a little bit, um, and the idea is, I think, to be able to, you know, have, um, a, you know, sort of network infrastructure, a nationwide network infrastructure, which is really important for primarily B two B types of capabilities. You need to be able to have that high reliability, high volume um, capability, high bandwidth capability to make sure that in the background. The records are going where they need to be, just like the banks have, you know, the um, their um, uh, you know their payment systems and ACH systems, all of that operating in the background to make sure that when you do your Venmo transaction, um, that's actually accounted for in real time. You don't have an expectation that you know you go to the bank and it says, oh well, you know, it's going to take us a month to update our record, um, to, you know, for that Venmo transaction. So just you know, um, bear with us. Um, so you you want that you want to make sure that those records are flowing where they need to be. That's the right place, the right time. Um, and uh, you know, for the right uh, for the right purpose, um, but you want to be able to have the front end fire APIs to um, have the kind of very specific, more nu nuanced and rich access that you know that all of us are now accustomed to. Individuals, others, um, you know, providers, uh, payers are you know are building based on more modern um, more modern conventions, and we want to be able to have a way to um, to be able to you know sort of build on that and not have to have them. You know, sort of try to force fit what are older, more you know, sort of heavyweight B two B types of standards for the richer types of experiences that we now have on the internet and every other walk of life that we want to be able to have here. So that's you know, kind of you know, we've got this world of network interoperability, we've got this growing world of Fire APIs, and with the Tefka Fire roadmap, we're connecting those or bridging them with the so-called you know, brokered or um, you know, non-brokered Fire capability, which is the idea of saying that we want um, fire APIs to proliferate as much as appropriate for patient use cases, for payer provider use cases, whatever those are, for public health use cases, let the market determine where that's appropriate. And certainly because of the nature of, you know, fire and RESTful APIs and, you know, OAuth, um, very, very, um, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, familiar um, kinds of patterns and capabilities that the rest of the internet is very used to. Um, the ability to sort of use that as the pathway for growth, I think, is you know is, is a great opportunity. But you also want to be able to have certain things that are really um, important to healthcare, which is scalability um, and trust. So how do you use network infrastructure like Tefka network infrastructure to be able to say, I can have my fire APIs, but I still have the problem of how do I locate patient records? How do I figure out where Alex Muggy's records are? I can have my Fire API, but am I still going to have to do that out of band? Am I still going to have to figure out, all right, it's these five places where her records are? And then out of band, figure out what's the electronic endpoint? What's the Fire endpoint uh, you know, for that? And figure out security. Am I going to have to you know, sort of figure that out one by one by one by one by one? What Tefka offers is the ability to say, we've got a security infrastructure. We've got a scalable contract or a scalable common, common agreement. We have nationwide, or we will have, and I should you know, speak in the future, nationwide record location services, nationwide endpoint directory to allow you to do that search on your own, you know, independently um, uh, using that network infrastructure, but then be able to fire off the fire API, you know, sort of as God intended, API to API, <laughs> and not have it, you know, be brokered in any way, right? And um, that's not the way, you know, right. APIs like to live. So I think that that's you know sort of the bridging and hopefully is the scalability that allows us to you know sort of move forward and have something that um, is uh, you know sort of makes sense um, and that um, brings those kind of pieces together. And I think you know the last um, you know sort of the last uh, uh, you know sort of um, uh, criteria for us here might be that we'll know that we're starting to achieve success when the front end users like providers 
don't have to think about interoperability anymore because it just works. Um, you know, that might be our ultimate litmus test here <laughs> is that it just works. They're not faxing. The information is just there and they have the high expectation that it's just that it's going to be there and it's as complete as it you know, could possibly be. Well, Alex Muggy, CMS, Mickey Trapathy, ONC, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, this has been a great discussion. We have 11 more following this that we'll get into some of the details. Uh, we have a TEFCA de dedicated discussion uh, coming up in the next several months. Uh, we're also going to be getting into fire APIs and the like, but thank you for your time and, and for your graciousness in participating with us and helping us help our community understand this journey better. Uh, we're going to stay online for another oh, approximately 26 minutes or so. Um, you're free. You're, you're, we'd love to have you stay if you're available and we want to open up the conversation to the audience as a whole, but we also recognize that your time is, is, is tight. And if you need to go now, yep. that, that works for us, but thank you both very much. And uh, we appreciate your time and your, your insights and your expertise Great. today. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed being here. Thanks, Tony. Thank you all. All right, we're opening up for general discussion now among those of you who are interested in talking about these things further. We encourage you to unmute your mic. I can only read the chat section so fast, so uh, as well as pay attention to what other things are going on the screen. But let me tell you a little about, about what we have coming up. Uh, next month, uh, we are going to be moving to the next stage of our interoperability, why interoperability, what is interoperability discussion. And John Kelly, uh, member of uh, the FIRE uh, Accelerator uh, Business Development Advisor, Senior Business Advisor to Edifex, and a member of the Board of Directors of Mass Health Data Consortium will be joining us on February 9th at 9 a.m. to talk about the, these. What are the end goals? You know, what are the things that we want to get done uh, with Fire? What what constitute outcomes that we expect to achieve? So, uh, you see the address there. Um, we could probably put that address in the chat section uh, so that you can register to join us for that. Again, we encourage you, if you're not a member of MHDC, to join MHDC. And if joining, if you're an individual and you want to participate in these discussions for the rest of the year, we, we encourage you to, to subscribe, uh, as these will be members-only and subscriber-only discussions going forward. So uh, you've had a taste today. We hope it's compelling. We have all the information about the coming 11 sessions uh, available for you. Um, and we look to continue this through the course of the year. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, throw open the microphones here and ask that folks um, on the call provide us your perspectives, your questions, any thoughts you have following today's initial conversation. And Dave, I want, Dave Caruso, I want to go back to the comment that you raised earlier about how you see a health user in the future benefiting from this kind of interoperability. Could you share that with us? Um, sure. The So the note I put in about um, an app on my phone and managing that experience, I just took it to, you know, what, what um, Mickey was saying reminded me, you know, I could do so many different things on Kayak or uh, Expedia. I can go on to Open Table, book, a, you know, the hottest restaurant in town, have no problems, but, you know, try to set up an appointment with my provider and try to manage the uh, you know, the healthcare infrastructure is just uh, a lot more challenging and it doesn't really need to be if we all get on the same page. It's it's akin to setting up an ATM network, right? In the early days, people thought, it, you know, it's just daunting and look at us. We would, you know, any ATM anywhere, pull up money and it's immediately debited to your account and we need to get the same kind of uh, interactions in healthcare as we go through the system in the future. It's just, uh, you know, I don't know how we're going to get there, but I think government has a role to play in mandating some of these transactions so that they, you know, incent payers and providers to take action. I think on our own, we'll just meander and it just won't, 
won't coalesce around the common faction, let's say. So. Yeah, Danny, I thought maybe <clears throat> maybe with though and CNC MS no longer on the call, we could chat yeah. a little bit about those comments around what the role the federal government plays here going forward. And to David's sure. point, to David's yeah. point, what, what I'm seeing, and I don't know if others are seeing this as well, but the the attachments rule that, that Alex Muggy was referring to, that was based <clears throat> on a 2016 letter from NCBHS to CMS. So that's what that's how far back yeah. they are in terms of just keeping pace with the industry requirements and changes going forward. And it's good that they're doing these things. And it's certainly better than it has been over the past few years. But it has been abysmally slow trying to keep trying for them to try to keep up with what the needs of the industry are in terms of regulation standards and interoperability requirements. They're doing a good job. Don't get me wrong. It's a huge task, but it's very slow moving. Yep. It does not move at the pace of industry change. So, yeah. Go ahead, Janice. Oh, I also just wanted to um, <clears throat> just follow up on the other part of what Dave was saying, because one thing, you know, we're looking a lot at equity these days, and those are all fabulous <clears throat> ideas. But one of the things that happens with some of that automation is that there's an assumption that that automation works for everyone. So one thing that one of the, the challenges of this world is to um, make sure that we go forward and we put in all those innovative ideas that make things easier for the majority of people, but that we don't lose the ability for people who need an extra option or can't use that option to function at all. That's yeah, that's a very good point. Right, to, Janet, to Janice's point, to just put a period at the end of that sentence, is that we as a community here in Massachusetts and even just anywhere in the U.S. have to continue to push forward and innovate. We can't wait yeah. for the federal government to continue to come back with recommendations and guidance and all of that. It's just, it, it will be a long, slogging, slow process if we do it that way, in my opinion. Seth, Seth Proctor, you had a great comment that I didn't have time to get to. Could you share a little bit about from your perspective, what you see as being a critical element to this interoperability discussion? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Denny. I mean, I think, uh, and thank you. This was a, a really interesting discussion. Really enjoyed this this morning. Um, uh, I think uh, I think Dave Q's comment a few minutes ago, uh, paralleling to the ATM network is a great example, uh, a great frame for thinking about this. There's enormous technology challenge in terms of thinking about how do you do interoperability? Um, and that's a lot of the, the conversation today about the kind of the, the how has a lot to do with the question about the different data formats. Is it FHIR versus another standard? Is it in the framework of TEFCA or some other kind of regulatory framework? Um, but then there's the why, right? And the, and the ATM networks had a very clear rationale for why and explaining kind of how consumers uh, and the need to exchange money started, uh, how businesses needed to be able to exchange money uh, nationally and internationally. So in addition to the ATM networks, you also have to look at like how SWIFT was evolving at the same time in terms of a backend network to parallel the consumer networks. Um, and I think as I was listening, especially kind of at the tail end of the conversation, I was listening to a lot of exchange back and forth about uh, trust between payers and providers and how there's, there's, there's not clear trust. And so there's uncertainty about exchanging data. Um, you know, but as I look at this as a, as a healthcare, something of a healthcare outsider, I guess, um, you know, I look at this as being about patients first and about, you know, interoperability is solving a problem. And to my mind, the problem is about improving outcomes for patients. And we heard several times, we heard Mickey talk about his experience with his mother. I think everyone has one of those experiences in their life, probably multiple of those experiences in their lives. Um, and so while we're talking about payers and we're talking about providers and we're talking about interoperability, the networks between them, the why has to be not because, uh, you know, providers can streamline something or because payers are trying to figure out how to, you know, make return on investment more effective. The why has to be about patients. And it seems to me that interoperability uh, and the resulting kind of order of magnitude more data exchange that flows with it. Um, and therefore the ability to put patients consent and, and put transparency for patients about that consent is critical um, and is an opportunity to invert these conversations. Because if we you know, take the example of, of the ATM networks and we think about TEFCA as a way for 
uh, providers and payers to just exchange data as much as they want in the back end, uh, patients will get lost. And that's going to erode trust. That's going to erode patients' ability to actually decide to lean in and engage with the health system. And that's not what we want. We want to build more transparency. We want patients to have more trust in these systems and have better outcomes, uh, which means that I, I think that as we're thinking about interoperability as a what, we also need to be really clearly focused on, on the why and the fact that it's about patients, not about kind of all the other issues that have been raised today. That's a really good point. I mean, when the initial interoperability uh, rules were introduced in the prior administration, one of the key elements of, of those rules was that the patient became the essential, you know, third leg of the stool, that payers and providers were not going to be able to do this on their own unless there was the grounding needs and central needs of the individual patient. And uh, that I think is, is where the trust issue, where the concern about, you know, our information will be used against us, uh, needs to be sort of reassessed in, in, with an eye toward, are we moving toward or away from what's best for the patient and what the patient requires? So I think that's, those are great comments, Seth. I appreciate that. Other comments from folks on the call. We'd love to keep this conversation going. Magali, you had some good comments about Puerto Rico and about you know your experience in the U.S. Can you share a little bit with us about what your your thoughts are? We couldn't get to your your comment, but we'd like to hear from you now if you'd share that with us. And your mic is muted if you're if you're online, if you're here to share that with us. All right, we'll move to others in the call. Um, I, don't yeah, think on I don't think she's still on, Denny. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think okay. she's she, still her, on. Her session, her session is there. I just clicked ask to unmute, but she's not responding. Oh, sorry. Other folks, other comments, other questions about today, about what we have planned coming forward, about the consortium. We'd love to use this opportunity to share more with you. Denny, I just want to add that I think um, Mickey uh, made a good point about the payer provider um, concerns and issues or tension, if you will, right? And I think that you know, there's got to be a way to break through those barriers. I had uh, messaged him privately that I wonder if there's some concern on the payer side. And I'm not point, uh, speaking for my company, Point32 Health, but I wonder if there's uh, concerns on the payer side that if that claims data is shared, it will be backtraced and compared to provider payments, bundle payments, quality reports, and things like that. And if there's ever a gap or a question, the audit trail is going to be a nightmare to walk through, right? And and that's why there's yeah. this uh, hesitancy to say, let's get full disclosure across the entirety of the ecosystem. Well, and, and Dave, that's actually an interesting point because one of the comments um, was exactly the same thing in the other direction on from the provider side, that mm -hmm. one of the fears on the providers sharing information is that they will get dinged for it later and it will cost right. them in some fashion, whether it's through some type of you know contracting or quality or whatever and i think that that you know regardless of which actor you're talking about whether it's the patient the provider the payer someone else a pharmacy whoever it is that this whole system to some extent relies on some level of trust which may or may not be there but it's sort of mandated it's sort it's sort of the same yeah. thing on the the patient can, consent i'm sorry no i was gonna say and it ties directly into what seth was saying right you, you have yeah. to have trust and support of the member and the patient right and and the quality of care yeah i mean like you know we, i was having a discussion about consent recently and it's the same thing right there's some level of trust because we don't require consent for everything and whether or not that that trust actually exists, it's kind of mandated to some extent. And so some of this is, I think the same thing that that sometime perhaps in some of these cases, the mandate comes before the trust, but we're being mandated to trust, if that makes sense. And that's hard, but, but, it's, but that's been part of the system, at least since HIPAA, 
from to some extent, right? Yeah. I I always thought if we could make our members the best managed patients from an admin perspective, from a clinical perspective, that it would benefit everybody. And it's hard to get, you know, that may result in lower, um, uh, you know, lower um, contracting rates and things like that, just because it's easier to manage a 0.32 health member from a provider perspective. But, you know, it's, it's like everybody's got different incentives, right? So mm -hmm. challenge. Yeah, and Denny, I was I was going to offer up a similar perspective that we see happen even on the pharmacy side. So it's frustrating to me when I interact with the payers, and you know, SureScripts is sort of sitting on a, a pile of information about not only you know medical record and clinical information, but the pharmacy data. And so we we see not only the paid claims, right, that come across the PBMs, but we also see the cash claims that are paid by a consumer directly into a pharmacy, which is the goldmine, right, for the payers who are trying to close gaps in care and even the providers, right? I mean, they don't always see all this information, especially if the patient's seeing multiple doctors. And so the limitation becomes, again, it goes back to this trust factor. Um, pharmacies are they don't give the data rights, you know, to, to broadly use that information for all of the use cases that, frankly, everybody would, would benefit from if we could allow it. And they're, they're, they're worried that, uh, you know, scripts will get moved out of their retail pharmacies or their pharmacy, right? Like if somebody got their hands on it, they'll, they'll try to reroute those prescriptions to someone else. And, and although that may happen, um, I question like what percentage of the time that will happen. And, and oh, by the way, like, why can't we build some sort of rules and penalties, right? If the, if the bad actors start to do that kind of thing, they're held accountable. Um, so those are just a few thoughts of mine. Thank you, Tim, that's, that, that, that's helpful. Other comments from folks in our, in our virtual room, other questions? Since this was our first one, and I apologize, I have a cold, folks. I'd be curious to hear, um, I think overall, our participants really enjoyed it. But I'd be also interested if anybody wanted to share feedback on, on uh, the structure or the questions, or did you get what you were expecting? Were you wanting something else? Uh, what do you look forward to for our next one? Anything like that but you don't have to answer that. I'm just throwing it out there since we have time. Well, I'm biased, Katie, but I thought it was very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. So uh, Katie, the comment I'll make is that I think what we learned in this call, as Mickey said, that was a quick hour. Uh, things go fast in these conversations and we have 12 of these, which Denny pointed out, but I don't, the, the time that we're gonna need to go through and really dissect and unravel a lot of these conversations is just never enough, but you know, we can't fix that, but that's just my opinion is that we're gonna need- Well, yeah, that's, that's part of why we we yeah. um, put in this 30 minute after, right. after session. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, Cause I, 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 I argued that we needed more time. <laughs> <laughs> but Always I, I think, people wanting more. <laughs> I, I think it would be helpful in at some point, either in the main section or in the 30 minutes that the guests stay a little bit longer to have some one on one interaction and not just through the chat. So that yes. folks could address Mickey directly or Alex um, directly. And you might have gotten some um, different, um, you know, conversation going between Mickey, Alex, uh, Tim or Mickey, Alex, um, yep. uh, uh, Ferris uh, or others on the call. And that we, 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 that actually was, was, was the intention. And we hope that that will be realized in future sessions. Yeah. Thank you for that, David. That's, that's very yeah. helpful. And it's, it's a lot to do in an hour, you know, it's yeah. almost, yeah. how do we get, how do we get smaller to get better? But I think yeah. uh, having this 30 minute at the end is a good chance for us to debrief as well as cover questions that folks might not have had we might not have had time to have answered by the presenters during the main part of the discussion. Right. 
All right, we're at uh, about 25 minutes past the hour. So don't forget, we have another session coming up. We also have one coming up on January 24th, uh, where we will be hearing from Dr. Clara Felice about the Mass Health Organization, the Agency for Medicaid Management in Massachusetts, and what the Mass Health is doing in the ways of achieving greater health equity. So. Uh, we encourage folks to join us for that. That's an open webinar. Um, it's uh, separate from this interoperability series, but it touches again on another critical aspect of what we're trying to achieve here, which is a more equitable <laughs> health system, especially for those who are likely uh, more disadvantaged than others. So please join us for that on January 24th. Uh, you can register on our website or uh, you can contact Katie, who will, um, I think Katie, if you would put your email back on the, on the chat box, people will know that they can reach out to you and ask for information about attending that. Uh, yeah, and with that- of Overhauling our website. So if you go to our current website, um, you will see uh, the event is on there and you can still register from there but the rest of the website is definitely under construction and we hope our <clears throat> new website will be out next week. Excellent, that's great news. Thank you everybody for joining us today. This was a great, uh, somewhat fraught start uh, to our, our upcoming discussions, but a great start nonetheless. And uh, you'll be uh, getting a brief survey um, at the close of this session, uh, we encourage you to fill it in and let us know your thoughts. And as I understand, Katie, uh, we will be sending the guests a, a survey correct. after the fact. Is that correct? correct? Okay. That is correct. Great. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, Denny Brennan, the Massachusetts Health Data Consortium, David Caruso, the Chief Technology Officer, Point32 Health, our, our co-chair. And we wish you a good, albeit gray and cloudy day if you're in our neck of the woods. So take care and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone, bye.